Welcome to McFarland's Corner. I'm Mike McFarland, your host and the Lake Fork Fishing Guide. All right, in today's corner, that's right, I'm bringing you a corner, not a rundown, so it's an actual corner. The topic today is going to be thermoclines, okay? Um, basically, we are going to talk about freshwater lake thermoclines. We're going to put a little bit of salt water in there just so you can understand how relative that a thermocline is to Mother Nature um, and the system. Okay, so it's specifically about primarily freshwater, but a little bit of saltwater stuff thrown in. Um, summer, winter, um, basically this was a request. So anybody that doesn't know, I run a YouTube page, um, a Facebook page, personal, and then a Facebook business. Um, and so throughout all that kind of social networking, um, I put it out there for requests, and this was a request. So here's your thermocline lesson, my man. All right. Before we actually get to the thermocline lesson, since this is a corner, um, the corner, uh, I always do a journal. All right. And what a journal is, is it's, it's like the rundown. Um, the Lake Fork rundown is a fishing report, if you will. Um, but the journal is supposed to be a lot more detailed for you. And I mean a lot. Okay. So stay tuned. We're going to get into exactly how McFarland Fishing has been catching the fish in McFarland's journal. All right. So the first thing I'll tell you is the last several weeks. Normally I do a corner once a month. Um, this has kind of evolved over the past couple of years. Um, at first I was doing a corner every week. And then uh, blah, blah, blah. And then I've skipped them. And it's just kind of been COV year and crazy weather and all the excuses I can give you. But I'm really trying to, to focus on having a rundown, a Lake Fork rundown. Um, even that changed. That was a daily rundown. Uh, now it's just a rundown. Um, but I, I want to bring it to you as much as I can. But I want to specifically have a rundown and a corner. All right. So in this corner, um, you know, the journal park fishing has been awesome. The last few weeks uh, we missed the corner for for the month of june um, but man it has just been awesome and getting better and better it's really weird because the weather's goofy it's been following along um in the rundown you know i've been giving you a report a, a daily report of the water and, and the temperatures and everything and this was last week's ending temperature okay the end bottom here we haven't changed in a week it's the middle of summer um, it's so light and, and, and mild and, and again, more cloud cover than ever before. and just a really moderate summer. So when we get ready to talk about thermocline, we haven't even had one in Lake Fork. All right. But the fishing's been awesome. It's consistently catching good fish, um, numbers of well, and every single trip, someone has caught a big fish. At least a Lake Fork special. Three weeks ago, I had double digit um, off a of structure at two o'clock in the afternoon. Um, so the mega bass, all right, if you've been following mega bass just fished, they had record numbers, 1800 plus anglers, and there were 22 plus overs weighed in. There were seven overs in the last hour. Unbelievable fishing coming out of Lake Fork for the middle of July. Um, and as I tell you about this thermocline a little bit, lack of thereof, that's why you understand more in a little bit. All right, we're in the journal. Um, how are we fishing? What are we doing? Well, I'm focusing on offshore stuff, obviously. Um, you know, structure. Um, and believe me, wood and timber in the water is not structure. That's cover. Okay, grass in the water is not structure. Um, a big wall of grass that makes an edge out way offshore, that maybe that edge could be a structure, considered structure. A big full oak tree that's fallen over a creek and the whole entire tree is still there probably could be considered a structure, um, a, a submerged full entire giant oak that's in 50 feet of water. The whole tree is still there, standing, timber and all. That could be considered structure. But generally, timber is not structure. I'm talking about long points, humps, road beds, shallow reefs with breaks into the deep water, shallow water near deep water, very important. Um, I'm talking about Areas that that have a, maybe a bridge underwater, okay, and, and an old roadbed, 
and it's got structure to it. It's like an escarpment uh, or a reef to the ocean. Um, and of course, the shell beds that are within those areas. The shell beds are the key for the best fishing. The shell beds are like a deer feeder. The shell beds are where the shad feed. That's where they find the plankton, the highest source of concentrated plankton. So the bass come to raid the shad. If you've ever seen a shad in the back of a cove, especially during the shad spawn, the shad are where the shad are. The shad never swim to go get eaten. The bass have to come raid them. So when they're shallow in the backwater, two, three, four feet of water, we see them teeming and flickering. And all of a sudden, they fly out of the water. We know something just raided them. The bass attacked them. Sometimes we get to see the swirls. But when we see the flickers and the shad fly, you know they've been raided. Well, I want you to use your imagination. That exact same thing is happening underwater in 18 feet, 20 feet, or wherever that shell bed is. That ball of shad is just down underwater. If you've ever seen an image on National Geographic of, of porpoises diving through bait and the bait <laughs> flares in the water, that's what's happening underwater on those shell beds, right? That bait gets attacked and it flares and it gets broken. If you graph the shell bed and the bait's round, nothing's been hitting it. Nothing's been attacking it. If the bait's all elongated and broken up into pieces, something has been attacking it from time to time. So again, these areas, these shell bed areas that I'm focusing the most on are like a deer feeder. It's where the shad find the plankton and then the bass come raid the shad. Very much timing, okay? Once you know what time to be there, man, it's awesome. A lot of times it has to do with the moon, the majors and minors. The bass on Lake Fork live by it. The big bass are caught on the majors and minors, right? So the gist of what we're doing there the range, the depth range, um, 10 to 14 foot, okay? Remember, I'm in a journal here, so focus on this. This isn't garbage. This is getting into real detail exactly how I'm catching my fish with my clients. Early morning, I'm starting out 6 a.m., 10 to 14 feet of water, okay? When I get to the baits in the description, I'll talk to you how I'm fishing them, how I'm actually working, and the angles and things that I'm throwing. Right now, the depth range in the morning is 10 to 14 feet. Okay. I want to find something windblown. I want to find a roadbed or a structure or an escarpment that drops off underwater. Okay, A plateau underwater that has shell on it and windblown in it, and I'm good to go. As the day progresses and it gets hotter, sun begins to angle shine 9, 10 o'clock, I find myself dropping out to the 18, 22, and 28 feet of water. Soon when we have a thermocline, I'm going to be forced to fish above the thermocline. That'll make more sense in a minute. Um, and I'll be fishing in about 20 to 22 feet of water. All right, right now, some of the best bites I've had have been in about 28 feet of water, 28 to 30 feet of water, previous, previous to a thermocline, okay? All right, so how are we fishing then? I've given you the depths, I've given you the strong structure, humps, road beds, points, thermo, uh, uh, thermocline, shell beds, etc. Now, if you've been following on, YouTube, you've seen the rundown. All right. My first and most favorite has been the Santone football jig. That's a three quarter ounce Santone football jig in the color JC Spicy Crawl. I tip it with two different baits. Generally, I'm tipping it with a large profile Rage Crawl lobster. That's a four inch. That's what you're seeing right now. All right. Sometimes I'll go ahead and throw the three inch. When I throw the three inch crawl, I trim the skirt. When I throw the four inch, I do not trim the skirt. It fits perfect, okay? And it makes a much bigger profile. It gets a bigger bite, all right? I'm throwing that on. My signature series, real-time rods, made by Mr. Louis Vaughn. Right there, real-time rods on the 17, okay? Cross from Pope's Landing, in other words, cross the 17 there. Um, but my real-time rods, custom-made for me, McFarland Signatures, MB, seven foot three, 1530. This thing is super powerful. I mean, I can deadlift a gallon of oil right off the deck of my boat. All right. If you're a boat flipper, you'll love this rod. I don't like the boat flip. I don't like to beat them up. But I throw it on 20 pound fluorocarbon and I use the Daiwa Tatula and I use the 100 with the 8 to 1. All right. With that football jig, here's what you've never got from me before. 
is how I fish it. Okay, first of all, I do not pull the rod in an upward motion. I pull the rod down. I drag the jig. I want to make contact with the stuff. I don't want it lifting and going over the stuff. I want it to clunk and bump. I'm mostly throwing it in shell. The more it clunks through the shell, the better. The more I lift it, it can tend to swim above them. So I want to drag down, almost intentionally stirring the bottom, stirring the dirt. All right? I drag very, very slowly and very methodically. I drag it one inch at a time. If I'm not feeling the clunk, clunk, all right, then I make sure I'm easing it, watching how much I move the rod tip, just a little bit at a time. A little bit. I don't pull that rod tip. That's the biggest mistake. People, I watch them pull it a foot. The rod tip moved a foot. The bait moved a foot. Okay? It's a little at a time. And then when the rod binds, when I'm pulling, 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 the rod begins to bind. That's when I get loose. And that's when I go ahead and hop it up over. And that creates that reaction strike. So I'm dragging, looking for a reason to make it hop up over great analogy I gave you. At the same time, I'm focused and I'm very much probing the bottom. When I'm in a shell bed, I want to feel it and count one clunk at a time. I usually will try to pull uphill. I can't always set up to pull uphill. Sometimes putting the boat up, up up top just doesn't work. It spooks the fish. If there's wood in there, you don't want to try and pull uphill. It's a nightmare. Okay. But both with the Santone shaky head and the football jig, I'm going to try and pull uphill. If I can't pull uphill, then I'm going to clip at an angle. I never fish perpendicular to the shoreline with these baits. I want to clip the break at an angle. Clip it. All right. And again, I'm pulling it. I want to count the clunks in the shell bed. When it goes, I pull and it goes, don't stop. At the most, it'll go, kadunk, kadunk, stop. Okay. The other day I was trying to teach my clients. They've been fishing for 20 minutes or more. I hadn't got bit on the jig. I threw the jig up. I knew the fish were there. When the bait hit the bottom, I felt it and I began to pull it. And I even set it on right in front of my clients. I said, please don't eat this. Please don't eat it. Please don't, don't, don't. Fish ate it. So I'm away with it. It was the hunter, not the arrow. It was how I did it that made the fish think it was real. That made the fish come investigate. That can Dishing the fish to whatever, that, that is mine, I'm going to eat it. Presentation, that's the word. The presentation is important. So I'm trying to teach you now. I'm going to give you my best verbal description right here in the journal. If you have to, book a trip with me and I'll show you how on the water because it's exactly what I do. All right. So that's the Santon football jig. Um, a lot of times I'll vary and throw the Pake's Perch color because bass love brim. Um, as we sw swing back around September and they get back on, the bass will start eating uh, the yellow bass. I tend to go back to the Pake's Perch and a little more chartreuse in the tail. But let's talk about that when we get there. All right. Next bait. I think that describes the jig. Again, I'm fishing 10 to 14 feet in the morning, 18 to 22 after that. I'm trying to drag the jig uphill and or clipping it at an angle. Okay, clipping the break. If I got a big break like this, I don't want to throw perpendicular and have the bait just come straight down. I want to clip it. All right. Angles a lot of times have everything to do with how many bites you get. All right. The other thing is a lot of times the brush piles. You want to make sure that jig is getting in and out of the brush piles. So be very, very subtle, disconnected and reconnected, disconnected and reconnected as you come through those brush piles. You can't just load the rod and try and pull it through it. You have to disconnect and loose clunk through it. It's the only way to do it. All right, <clears throat> second bait, Santone's football shaky head, 5 16 ounce with a magnum zoom trick worm soaked in real time rods magic reaction. All right, this is bait number two. I fish it in exactly like we fish the jig. It's a lot lighter. You will not feel the clunk near as much. I had to throw this on a 1225. It's a McFarland Signature MB 7'3", 1225. It's equal to a 5 power, where the jig rod is a 6 power. Throw it on 20 pound 4 carbon line. Tatula 150 instead of the 100. A little bit more line, a little more capacity for it. Um, but I really like that. I use that rod for a lot of different things, and that's why. For the shaky head worm, it works perfect. And again, I fish it in the same places as the jig. The shell beds are the opportune places. Drag that thing uphill. The more you drag this worm uphill, the better. Okay? I've talked about this before, but here's why. Specific. 
This is a stand up shaky head. So it naturally will stand up, okay? If you throw on an incline, as you pull, gravity, even underwater, will let it roll. It'll let the tail of the worm fall, and it can roll. It'll pull and slide faster. I want you to fish slow, remember? You drag uphill, going the other way, and this worm stays completely upright the whole time. I think I've made my description here. It's kind of hard to do that. But in other words, that worm stays standing up the whole time that it climbs the hill. Fish a shaky head uphill and watch how many more bites you will get okay all right <clears throat> a lot of times i've described these shell bits uh, to you as timing and a lot of times you don't know that timing so you either camp on that shell bed long enough to learn it um and boy that can be redundant um a couple days in a row when you realize they're not biting there they're not at the shell bed from eight to ten in the morning they're just not there. I did it Monday. I did it Tuesday. Well, let's do something different on Wednesday. Where are they? Um, where are they? They're not visiting the dinner table. Well, where are they? They're in the trees. They're in the wood. They're out suspending in the bedrooms. Um, so from time to time, a third way that I'm catching these fish is I'm having to go use a sonar and find them, literally find them. On the shell bed, sometimes I don't want a sonar. I don't want to graph them because it spooks them. They are there to eat. They see that boat hover over. They leave. Okay. In the bedrooms, they're not going to leave. I'm not going to scare them out of the bedrooms. Okay. So the bedrooms is in the trees, offshore, suspending in the wood. They live in the trees. I'm not going to scare out of the tree that they've already gone to for cover and to hide in. So I go graph them now. Now I find them with the sonar and it's usually very dense and heavy trees. Um, they'll suspend in the tops of them as the thermocline comes. Right now they're in them from all levels, at the bottom, at the base, throughout the whole trees. So the best way to fish them if I was to throw the jig or to throw the shaky head, man, we'll get stuck. We'll get hung up a lot. And sometimes I do throw those baits because they get bit. They get the bigger bite. But the most convenient way is to go to a Texas rig worm, peg the weight. All right. You can use tungsten or lead, quarter ounce. Okay. About as heavy as you want to go. I'll even go lighter sometimes because I want this to fall real slow. All right, I go to a ribbon tail worm. This is a 10 inch power worm. I love the plum color and I love the red shad color. Um, sometimes I'll even go to a 12 inch and I've been known to take a piece of a used four inch and glue it to a 12 inch and I now have a 16 inch. But this worm is how I run through the trees. It's Texas rig, it's peg, it's a five odd hook, six odd as the worm gets bigger. It's got a nice ribbon tail. And this I wanna actually cast over the trees past the trees, and when I retrieve this, I'm gonna pull it in little pools so that the ribbon tail swims. If I just crawl this like the jig, that ribbon tail is never gonna swim, it's just gonna lay dead. So I wanna just kinda of pull it in little zips, make the tail swim. Now I wanna move this thing a foot at a time instead of an inch at a time. I'm casting over the trees, targeting the trees with a sonar. Mark them with a waypoint. Throw a buoy if you have to. Cast over the trees and retrieve that bait. It's going to, first of all, sink on the backside of the tree. It's then going to climb the tree, fall down through the tree, and over the tree. All right, when you feel that, you need to learn how to mooch it through it. The better you can mooch it through the tree, the more bites you'll get. I can tell you this by doing seminars on the tanks. When the bait falls to the bottom through the tree, it's climbing, it's climbing, and all of a sudden it goes over and falls to the bottom. If the bass follow it, they will eat it. That's the trick, to get the bait to come up over the tree and fall vertically down into the tree. A brim or a crawfish is going to approach the tree and literally crawl in and out of anywhere he wants. He's not going to swim up to the tree and on the count of three, just in bed and get stuck. All right? You should be laughing on my boat. Anybody that's had that lesson does laugh because I make it kind of funny. But Texas rig, power tail worms, or power worm, ribbon tail type worms. You can use the zoom old monster as well. I just love the power worm because I love scent. All right. I believe power worm has made a big business out of scented worms. Bass eat them much more and they hold them more. So that power worm going in those trees works real good for me. Number four. Remember, we're still in the journal. I told you this journal was going to get in detail. Um, those trees. Those trees tend to be pretty deep for me. As I described, I get out offshore, 18 to 28 feet of water. Um, sometimes I'm in 40 feet of water because I found an oak tree and I'm fishing the tops of it. 
and I may be in 50 feet of water because the tops are 22 and the bass are suspending in the tops of those trees. All right. Um, so the trees that I tend to fish are pretty deep. 18, 22, 28. Um, and, and, and again, as this thermocline comes around, that changes completely here soon. Very, very soon. All right. Another deal. We just had mega bass. All right. Um, We've had a lot of pressure with COV. Um, there's been a lot of extra fishermen. With uh, weekends, the parking lots have been full. Um, so occasionally I'm running into the fish just being finicky. All right, They are on the shell bed. They are there feeding. And we just can't catch them. Um, and I really, they won't eat the jig and they won't eat the shaky head. And why? Well, it's because of been fishing pressure. They've been, I've been there beating them up for several days. And many other guys have hit them. And, and they're, they're just got finicky. They got tight lipped. They got smart. Well, what am I doing? Um, again, if you're following me on YouTube, the Lake Fork Guide on YouTube, you see the rundown, you already know where I'm going. I go to a finesse jig. A lot of guys will go to the drop shot rig or a chicken rig with a, a Carolina rig, and I will too. But my favorite, big bass love jigs. Okay, My favorite is to go to a Santone round head. Now, this is their finesse jig. It's a round head. It's really small. In fact, let me compare this to the full-size jig for you. Okay, so here's my big one. Here's the big one with the lobster. Okay. And here's the Santone Finesse. Massive difference, okay? Massive difference. I still catch just a big bass. All right. Yesterday, I took my buddies fishing. The day after Mega Bass, man, those fish were tight-lipped. They were smacking the bait almost like they were. Like if you ever bed fished and you see them blow the bait out, instead of actually suck it in, they blow it away or they fan it away. That's what they were doing. They were smacking the baits. They said, I don't want nothing to do with those baits. They knew from the day before, 1,800 anglers had beat them up. And we were missing a lot of bites. And when we did catch them, it was the outside of the mouth. And they're getting off. And then I switched to the Santone finesse jig. And I beat the brakes off the bass. I went up eight to one on my buddies. All my fish were deep in the throat, hooked in the roof of the mouth. Uh, my favorite colors are the same that we're talking. Pegs Perch, J.C. Craw, P.B. and J. Um, Bass Candy, tip them with a Rage Craw, small trailer, the tiny little trailer now. Everything is basically the same, just downsized to finesse. What do I throw this on? I throw this on my MB 7'3". This is now a lighter rod it's a finesse rod it's a 10 20 a four power i go to 15 pound test by the way i do the same thing with the worm rod okay it's a 10 20 four power probably should have a little bigger rod for the tree fish um, but i love that lighter line the way that worm falls um, i found the heavier line and the light worm it just doesn't cast the same thing here the heavier 20 pound test and that finesse jig it just doesn't cast as well so I go to 15 pound on a 10, 20 MB, seven foot three real time custom rod, McFarlane signatures. We run the Daiwa reel on it. I love it. It works, man. It works. All right, so there's bait number four. Um, that's mostly in the shell beds. Like I said yesterday, um, I just beat my friends said, they said, this isn't a guide trip, Michael. If you're not wetting a line, we're not wetting a line. You have to fish the whole time with us. So I said, okay, you asked for it. And uh, sorry, Mr. Fletcher, um, but I put a beat down on my bros. Um, a big time beat down on my bros. It was fun for me. I don't get to do that very often. It almost made me think that maybe I do want to venture back into some tournaments. Um, I can catch them. <laughs> not to be too, I'm usually very humble, but I can catch them. Um, it was cool. All right, final bait for you. And I'm going to tell you, I'm really not catching a lot of fish. I've caught a few. I don't throw this to catch fish. I throw this to stir the pot. For whatever reason, I know those bass are there. I've graphed them. I saw them. I can tell it's, ha it's, it's on the brink. They're just not going. They're not happening. I found a big school of fish, and they're just not fired up. The flutter spoon will do it, okay? A big 10XD crankbait or something like that, drug through them, can do it. This flutter spoon will do it. This is a five inch Lake Fork Tackle Lures flutter spoon. Um, I basically, again, I throw this past the school and man, I'm vicious with it. I rip it, rank it, I don't know what you want to call it, do to it. I'll swim it through in the first cast or two. I am just actually throwing it through the school to stir the pot, 
I want to make them move. I want to make them swim. If there's a school of bait fish there, I want to make that bait flare like we discussed before. The bait's round. It's unbothered. I'm not going to spook the fish that are sitting off the deep edge. I'm going to spook the bait. Does that make any sense? So I graft a shell bed. I see the bait is round. That's all I'm finding all morning long. All right? I'm going, hmm, there's nothing feeding. But I saw those one bass that were sitting off the break. Those bass were 20, 30 yards from that bait. I'm going to go throw that spoon through the bait and rip that sucker, make that bait freak out, and the bass draw up, and my clients catch fish. Baby, that is how it's done. That is a really cool secret for you. It's not the tip of the week, um, but it should be. <laughs> so that is how I'm fishing, all right? If you'd like to experience it firsthand, I'd love to show you. Please book a trip with me, McFarland Fishing. You can get my number right there on the wall. Find me on Facebook, Lake Fork Adventures Guide Service, or Mike McFarland. I'm full personally. No friend request available personally, but my Lake Fork Adventures page, wide open. YouTube, you can follow me on YouTube, The Lake Fork Guide. Please subscribe. Please subscribe. I tell it to you like it is, and I tell the truth. All right, tip of the week. We're rolling pretty good. I haven't done a corner in a long time. Tip of the week. Um, my tip of the week is today's fishing lines are getting more and more expensive, especially the four carbon. Um, and a guide like me that really fishes six days a week and have fishermen of all classes, both beginners, intermediate, experienced, um, you know, the, everything takes its, its toll. And I have found that this KVD spray is very important to me. Um, not necessarily every day. Um, and not necessarily with all lines, but specifically with my fluorocarbon lines, my really expensive lines. Um, I have found that if I'll just take this KVD spray once or twice a week, okay, or on a day when I know it's really got some use and dirty water or whatnot, but if I just take this KVD spray and I'll spray about three or four, maybe five, six turns, a couple of different times, soak that spool, and let the bait go up and down so that it gets into the spool, all right, let it sit maybe five minutes, okay, maybe a little more than that. That line conditioner, the first thing it's going to do is soften all that line, all right? The next thing I'm going to do is I got a long driveway. Most of us have some kind of driveway or backyard. If you can, you're going to take it out there now. You're going to hook it up to a little cleat on a fence or something. Stretch that line out. Take a little piece of fabric, wet it with the KVD spray, and run that line through it coming back in. That cleans it, all right? I know that may sound like a whole lot to pain in the butt. And some of you that just got infinite amount of money just don't care. You'll put new line on. I can tell you, I do that with new line because it cleans and conditions it right from the get-go. It's smoother. The very next morning when you go to cast or if you put that away for a week, when you go pick it up in a week, you won't regret it. Smooth, nice casting. Look, there's a reason I got three bottles over there on my line counting station. It works. It's really, really good stuff. All right? That is the tip of the week. Product, all right, product of the month. In past corners, I have always had a product of the month. Um, being that I haven't done many corners in the past couple of months or any corners in the past couple of months, I'm going to today decide to do something a little different. I'm gonna give you my current top three products, all right? Um, remember, there's a topic coming here, so stay with me, folks. This is a corner. It's probably going to be close to an hour before we're done. All right. Thermocline lesson coming soon. All right. So products, current top three products right now. Um, really, really hard for me. There's many fishes I've been catching. To not choose the Zoom Magnum trick worm as my fishing product, bait-wise, soaked with magic reaction. Those two, that two combination right there, that one-two punch, the Zoom Mag Trick Worm, an African special, really the color, you know, three weeks ago was the watermelon candy. So it's the Zoom Mag Trick Worm soaked in the real-time rods, magic reaction, one-two punch, it catches fish. So that's product number one. My second favorite product currently at the time is the Daiwa Reels. All of them. The Daiwa Taptula series is probably one of the best, most smoothest, most dependable, reliable fishing reels that I have ever used in my entire life. And I run Shimano and lived with Shimano for over 30 years. I'm not knocking Shimano's product. 
but I'm raving about the Daiwa product. My clients rave about this product. They ask, what is this? What wheel is this? It's so smooth. It works for everybody, beginners, intermediate, advanced. Nobody says, this reel doesn't work for me. The beginners can open it up and throw it farther than they've ever thrown. Uh, the advanced, same thing. They say, what is this? The Daiwa products, product number two. And product number three, um, I've sold it already. Um, Miko, I know you watch some of my shows. You're about to inherit the most awesome bass boat that I ever owned in my entire life. Thank goodness I'm getting another one, 2021. But the third product, um, this should be the product of the year, um, as rough as this lake was and the wind and everything that hit us. But my third product, product of the month, product review, whatever you want to call this, is just the absolute most awesome Skeeter FXR from Diamond Sports Marine. All right. It is a workhorse and a half. I put 150 hours on this bad boy. I haven't had a single hiccup from the engine, not a belch, not one moment where you said, what was that? The most dependable, reliable Yamaha four-stroke engine on the market. And the boat, oh my gosh, what an absolute beast. It tears up the rough water like no other boat. All right, it's a completely different ride. You have to adjust to it and get used to it. But as I learned to drive this thing, it's an animal. It's a monster. There's not one single stress crack. You cannot find a stress crack in this boat. You cannot find a scratch on this boat. Um, and it went through a really rough season. So product number three, the Skeeter FXR21. What a boat. All right. All right. We got through it. We're ready for a lesson. We're ready for a topic. All right. Today's topic, thermoclines by request. The thermocline, what is a thermocline? A thermocline is basically a st steep temperature gradient, all right, in a body of water, um, such as a lake or the ocean. And really, it's, it's marked by a layer above and below of two different temperatures. So in other words, it's a line, it's a layer, a gradient. It's a gradient that it's, it's a layer that separates two different temperatures or water columns, okay? Um, what causes it? Well, it's in essence, it's formed by the effects of the sun. Um, the sun heats up the upper water column. Um, basically, in the ocean, you have a lot of currents, so this changes. It's a little different in the ocean than it tends to be in, in the lakes. Um, but the upper water column gets warmer, and there's a distinctive line that establishes, which separates from the lower, cooler, more dense water. Okay, um, this line that forms between the two is called a thermocline. It's generally cloudy. If you're a scuba diver and you've ever experienced it, when you dive through it, it you you have this layer of like cloudiness. Uh, generally, a solidified Thermocline, meaning a completed thermocline, will only be about 18 inches, okay? Um, again, if you're scuba diving, when you go through it, it's like putting sunglasses on. Not only do you feel the water get cooler below, but you it's, it, there's lack of sun now. It's like sunglasses. It gets darker. Not necessarily dark, but darker, okay? Um, so what? You know, really, the sun and the heating of the upper water column, unlike the winter, hot water heat rises so you heat that water column up and a thermocline builds and creates a separating from the lower water column in the winter times it's the opposite you get the heat the cooling cool water sinks it sinks through the entire water column and begins to break the thermocline and we're going to talk about that in just a little bit all right so what is the layer what is the layer um it's really the transition between those two water temperatures um, again, I talked about it. It's, it's mostly cloudy. It's like a milky, it's not dirty water. Um, in the ocean, they say even plankton sometimes, a large enough source of plankton can, can create a thermocline in a specific area, separating two water temperatures. Um, and really what that is, is that thermocline is there, but the plankton feeds right at that level. 
the plankton finds its food right at that thermocline in that milkiness, okay? Um, and that's a little more elaborate than we need because that's ocean. Um, in essence, as I said, it tends to become a cloudy layer, about 18 inches, a line on your sonar. Now, in Lake Fork, we tend to see that big haze. It begins and builds from the bottom up, all right? And it, you'll literally see it rise, rise, rise. And if you fish enough, you'll see it. First of all, it was like six-foot haze. And that six-foot haze, it looked like it sank, but it didn't. From the bottom, it came up and locked and solidified at around the 18-inch layer, okay? Basically, whether you are in freshwater or ocean there's usually no oxygen immediately below that in most cases okay um that's a real big question people say you know in the ocean it's generally shallow water okay the bays and the harbors because you have so much current and so much movement that it, oxygenation happens out everywhere those bays and things is where that upper water column can get real real hot separate and you'll get the shallow water in the ocean is where the thermoclines can establish. It's the opposite of the lakes. It's offshore. It's in the deeper water. You don't have the currents. And if we don't have wind, then the thermocline really sets in. If we have a lot of wind in the lakes, like we have this year, for example, the thermocline can't set. It tries. The sun does its part, heats up the water column, but the wind blends the lake. And the thermocline begins to build and gets broken. It begins to build and gets broken. We have not had a solidified thermocline this year in Lake Fork. It keeps trying. You'll see it. Sometimes you'll see it in the morning real good, and it goes away later in the day. Um, the winds, we consistently have had winds. All right, so, but the question was, is there oxygen below? No, there generally isn't. In most Northeast Texas lakes, in most shallow born lakes like we have here, there will not be oxygen below. And if you find yourself fishing below, you're gonna get a lot fewer bites. Um, the fish can go below to feed just for a little bit, but there's generally nothing to feed on down there because there's no oxygen down there. So why are they going to go below when there's no oxygen? They don't. This condition on Lake Fork can be the toughest time of the year. When we have July be no wind and August even no wind and we get that stagnant lake and we get that thermocline that layers in, they can't be below it. They're forced to suspend above it. And that not, is not necessarily the best conditions. Okay, in some cases, some clear lakes in California, etc., there is good water below because they're 200, 300 feet. The thermocline builds at the 30, 35 foot range. And normally, if you only had another 30, 35 foot of water, there would not be oxygen. But there's another 200 feet of water. So the fish actually in California lakes and Arizona lakes use below the thermocline. They use it as a sanctuary. It's cooler water. It's like a place to go. And it's just the reverse in the winter. It's not actually a thermocline, but there's still two different water columns, warmer below and cooler above. And so it acts as basically a separating of two water columns. That's what a thermocline does. It doesn't matter whether it's winter or summer, okay? The question is, is, is it good and healthy for the fish and is there oxygen in it? And again, in summertime here in our lakes, you do not want to fish below because there is no oxygen in it, okay? All right, what happens in Fork um, is, is it gets really, really tough because of the thermocline. And there's only one guy I know that does really, really well, and that's Mr. Mark Pack. Um, the fish move all the way out offshore, um, and they're gonna suspend in the 2022 range just above that thermocline. Well, they wanna relate something. So the only thing they're gonna have is trees that are offshore in deep enough water that that tree is tall enough to surpass the water column so they can be in the tree at 18 foot or the tops of the tree is at 18 foot and they are in the tops of that one tree sitting right above that thermocline that's my best description it's really really hard to find those fish it's even harder to fish for those suspended fish okay mark peck's the only one i know that's mastered it and i'm sure right now um, fishing's good enough that he doesn't care uh, if it goes to that well He'll just go to that and he'll keep catching them. <laughs> we'll all say the dog days of summer have now hit. Dog days of summer are usually created once the thermocline is solidified and the fish are forced to suspend. Okay. All right. Let's keep going here. What about in the wintertime? Is there such thing as a winter thermocline? You know, the scientists say no. Um, there really is no 
thermocline and, and in fork there isn't for sure it all the water what happens is is if we get a thermocline in the summertime the very first cold front we hit in september october cold water sinks so the surface gets cool gets some rain it sinks through the water column it hits to the thermocline breaks the thermocline and now all of that content and debris and junk that was below okay comes floating to the top and that's our turnover so realistically in the winter time there really isn't a thermocline sometimes you'll find even here on fork if we have a hard enough winter it'll look like a thermocline. It kind of does the same concepts. The fish will get down in 40, 43, 45 feet of water, but it's got to get real, real, real cold. And what's happening is, is yes, uh, science calls it something a little different, but you will have two water columns still, and the deeper water is warmer, okay? Just the opposite effects of summer. And yes, the bass and the bait fish go there. How many times in the hard, hard winter have you seen some pro or any guide on Lake Fork talking about the shad being out in 40 feet of water 50 feet of water it's warmer than above okay all right um gonna get to some more stuff here then i get just even a little more specific i kind of already have but let's just talk the ocean all right in the ocean there's three layers the scientists consider it three layers you have your surface layer okay and you have your deep ocean layer and then you have your sediment layer, the sediment floor, they call it, sea floor. All right, depending on what kind of contents on the floor and sediment can change the temperatures down on the bottom. So that's three different layers in the ocean. Um, the thermocline separates one and two, okay? Surface, deep water, sea floor, all right? In most of our lakes, we definitely have three layers. Um, I would almost say, I'm no scientist, so I'm going out on a limb, but I would almost say that there's possibly four, okay, because there could be seafloor in our lakes as well. In other words, different bottom content, whether it be hard clay or soft mud, is going to have a different temperature at the bottom, which creates another layer, okay? But anyways, we've got a subsurface, which is what I talk about all the time. The very first 1 to 18 inches of a lake. Since you don't have big ocean currents in a lake on a daily basis, you get the surface that warms up. Just the subsurface. It warms up daily and cools down nightly. Warms up daily, cools down nightly. That's called your subsurface. And that's what Mike McFarland gives you every day in the report, the subsurface temperatures. All right? Then you have your first water column, and it's separated from a thermocline if one's established. And you have your second water column, all right? That's three now, three layers. The fourth being, if in fact we do have a seafloor or sediment layer. I don't know, okay? But I do know about the first three. Sub, first surface, second surface, all right? With that being said, I want to get to specific now about Lake Fork. Normally around June, we start building a thermocline. We've had no thermocline. We went the whole entire June with no thermocline. In fact, we had two cold fronts in the middle of June. The Texans said, wow, I've, I've lived throughout my life and never seen it. The temperatures are so far behind. We're just now trying to build a thermocline. What that has done is it means the entire water column is one fish tank. There's not two layers or three layers like I just talked. There's a subsurface layer and a water column. We've been seeing this for almost two months. The fish are scattered. There's guys still catching them in two feet of water. I'm catching them in 10 to 14 and then 18 to 20 because they are in the entire water column. That's what's been making Lake Fork tough lately. And as a matter of fact, as I just kind of conclude some of this with you, as I teach it to you, I teaching myself and learning myself my seventh year on Fork. It's also one of the reasons that Lake Fork fish is so tough year round. Lake Fork is just one big fishing pond. It's a big fish tank in your home that a lot of the year, it's all one big water column. They can be anywhere they want. They don't have to pick a, a zone. They don't, they, they just don't. Um, they're not forced to be in an upper water column or a lower water column. They've got a lot of variation where they can be. This is a needle in a haystack sometimes. All right. Um, but here's the deal. On Lake Fork, what depth does a thermocline generally appear? 20 to 24 feet, okay? Once you see it, 
fish above it. All right, what month should you expect to see it? Uh, June, July, August, September, depending on the heat and the wind. Wind, big wind. We can get a thermocline established and rocking, and it's working, and, it, and, it, and all of a sudden we get two days of huge south winds, churns the lake, breaks it up, okay? Beats it up and it goes away. Um, so depending on heat, winds, um, but June, July, August, September, those are the months you're going to see the effects potential thermocline building in Lang Fork. Again, no oxygen below. The fish suspend in Texas lakes, especially in Lang Fork, above that thermocline. All right. Open water sometimes in no man's land. All right. Um, what's it look like on a sonar? It's a haze. It's a cloud. Many of you might think all of a sudden something's wrong with your sonar. Um, literally. Uh, in the wintertime, we get some big floods and the lake hits and I see the soot come in and I watch that haze sink from top to bottom. This is the opposite. It starts at the bottom and it's weird. It rises and solidifies in the 18 to 22 foot area. Okay. Remember, fish below that haze, you won't get much bites. All right. And then the final thing, I hope I've answered the question. You asked about thermoclines. Um, if I have left anything unanswered, please put the comments below and I'll do my best to get back to it. Um, but the last thing I'm going to leave you with is the very first cold front, and I've already said this, but I'm going to be a little bit redundant. We get a thermocline, which we're having now, July, August, September. We're going to have some no wind days, no wind weeks <laughs> coming. Stagnant. It's going to be breathtaking. The humidity and huh, takes your breath away at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. You see the swelter rising off the lake. All right. That's going to happen all the way through about September. We'll get our first cold front. We get the first heavy cold rains and the lake will turn over. Okay. When we get to that point, that's going to be another lesson, another day. I'll talk to you uh, again a little bit about what and why it caused it. But now you know the you know the forefront of it of before the turnover. And it should help make more sense when we discuss the turnover. But anyways, if you do have any questions, um, please put them in the comments below. Don't forget to give me thumbs up. Um, I really always appreciate that. Or hit the like button if you're learning, if you enjoy it. I appreciate you sticking in there with me um, and, and staying through such a long show. Um, hey, COV's going on, so hopefully I was entertaining enough to keep you to the end. Man, again, I'm Mike McFarland. Really appreciate you all watching. I love what I do, and I love to share it with you. So I hope it helps you catch more fish, bigger fish, and uh, don't forget to send me those pics when you do. So thanks for watching, everybody. McFarland's Corner right here, the Lake Fork Guide, giving you a corner talking about thermoclines.